probably pines will hire you based on that. But generally speaking, $100, the first $100 in the first six months is actually good. It's not bad, even though it may seem like that, because after six months, you might be earning uh, yearly $50,000, $60,000 once, uh, once you have a reputation built. You may spend up to a year acquiring a new skill after which you have to start selling it. So you can spend a long time learning a skill, but just spend a year developing a skill. Uh, usually people start after six months. As soon as you learn something, try to sell it. So if you've learned a part of something big, just focus on trying to get clients for that part. Sell that skill as quickly as possible. It is a good idea to acquire multiple skills that are somehow related to each other. For example, you can choose to learn logo design along with UX wireframe design. The two are closely related as they use similar tools. So logo design, everybody knows what logo is, but you use Photoshop. So on Photoshop, you can also design wireframes. You can also design backgrounds for games. You can also design characters. So if you're using a tool, learn what you can do using, the, using that tool, all of the different things that you can provide. So it should not just be one thing, it should be many. For example, I use the Unity game engine. It can be used for animation, for videos, for 3D modeling, for prototyping, for AR, VR. There are so many things that that tool can do. I, I develop 2D games, 3D games. I develop uh, educational games. So you should know what your tool can do and how many things your tool can do for you. They, they, they should be related. So the, the work that you do should be related somehow because UX, wireframe, the tools are similar and also wireframes are used for website design and logos are needed on a website. So that's how they're related. There is no get rich quick trick some freelancers may be at the right place at the right time and make millions during the fir their first year, whereas the majority start to make a decent living in their third year. That's just me being honest. Next, next slide. Do you need to work for a company before thinking about freelancing? It depends on your field. It depends on your field. A company may help you get an idea of a standard process that the particular industry uses to get work done. So sometimes you need to work for a company to get an idea of the industry standards. Sometimes you need to actually work for a company. You can also simply learn about standard processes without working for a company. This is extremely difficult to do as resources for that may not be available online. So if you're not working for a company or you've not, you don't want to work for a company, you can still find out what their standard process is, but it's difficult. It really depends on whether you can find it on the internet. There are certain fields that simply require you to work for an organization for some time. So uh, doctors, usually need to work at a hospital before they start their private practice. Next slide. How to get my first project. It is recommended that you create an account on Fiverr, Upwork, and Guru to start. Other platforms include PeoplePower, Freelancer.com, and Toptal. The process of getting a project depends on the platform. Fiverr is a platform where clients find you. Upwork is a platform where you need to find clients by sending proposals to clients that have a job posted on their, on their feed. So it really depends. Uh, if you are on Fiverr, you may need to respond to something called buyer requests. But on Upwork, you will have a difficult time getting your first project because uh, there might be experienced freelancers with a history that people might consider hiring them instead of you because you have zero history. But on certain platforms, it's easier to get your first job. On other platforms, it's difficult. However, it really depends on what suits you. You may, you have to be quick to respond to a potential client and immediately start talking about the potential client's problems. You can start by asking intelligent questions. So on up, when you start on Fiverr and on Upwork, you have to be very active. So as soon as the client uh, messages you, respond immediately because they might be messaging other people as well. So you want to engage them right then and there. Only talk about the solution that you can offer to the client based upon the answers that the client gives. So this is because the client does not have anything on the platform that will tell them about you. No history, no work history, no success rate, nothing. You can talk about the previous projects that you have done 
off platform, but they will have nothing, no data on you. So immediately start talking about this, uh, the, about the problems and the solutions, so that the client uh, client understands. Okay, this guy knows what he's talking about. He knows his stuff. Use a technique called price bracketing, which is just a price range instead of a fixed price. This will help you get an idea of how much the client wishes to spend and may help you engage the client. So instead of saying, okay, I'll develop a website for you for $2,000, you're going to say, okay, so I'm going to develop a website for you. I think the price is going to be between $1,000 to $4,000. It really depends on how much value you require. So let's talk about what you require and how many features you require. And based on that, I'll be able to give you a fixed price. But just to engage the client, between 1000 to 4000 the client will say, well, that's a big price range. So what's the difference? You're going to say, if you have this, this, this feature is going to be 1200 This is this, this, this feature, 1800 This, this, this feature is going to be 3000 So you're engaging the clients. You're giving them multiple options, which is a part of selling, actually. If you're confident that you can provide a good solution and the client is paying you for the solution according to its value, continue the conversation. So if the client wants a solution that is worth $5,000 but is, uh, is, uh, wants to pay you $1,000, just discontinue the conversation. It's not going to be good for you and it's not going to be good for the client either. In fact, the person who is going to do something that is worth $5,000 for $1,000, they will be taking shortcuts. And if they get it done, I mean, the good clients will actually know that this person has taken a shortcut or this is plagiarized or this is copied work, which can get the client in trouble, especially if it's uh, something he's using something that is licensed. Try to define the first module after defining a scope of work, then attempt to close the deal. So say that, okay, we have 10 tasks, let's do one and two, and this is the price for that, and try to close it right there. Next slide. How to minimize the risk of the project failing. Always provide screenshots, demos, drafts, or test builds to the client as soon as they are ready to, uh, as soon as they're ready to get feedback. So as soon as you complete something, take a screenshot, or give the entire file to the client, get their feedback as quickly as possible, because if they don't like something, they'll tell, tell you immediately that they don't like this and they want this to change. If you're not clear about what to do, ask the client about what to do. So if you do not know what, uh, what, the client, what you should do, just ask the client, learn how to ask. Just ask them, listen, I do not know what we should do here. What should we do? Instead of trying to figure out yourself, just ask the client. They will, they will answer the question if they're not bad clients. If you feel directionless, ask the client for direction and talk about possible ways to, com to complete a module. So if during a module you feel like you do not know what to do next, ask the client what we should do next. And then talk to the client about the possible ways to get around this problem if there is one. Make sure that the client approves drafts, demos, screenshots, or test builds, and keep a reference of that approval in text form as a screenshot or in a video form. So if the client approves task A and B, save it somewhere. So the client doesn't, uh, if, he, if the client comes back and says, wait a second, I never approved that, you can say, well, you did. So we're not going to do this again. So that's it, it's done, it's finished. You're not going to talk to me about this again. Make sure, oh, I've already done that. If you feel like a module isn't well-defined, tell that to the client and make sure that it is well-defined before starting it. So if you feel that task A and B, there is something that you don't understand, tell the client, I don't understand this. We're not going to start this project unless you tell me what this is. We have to make it crystal clear what this is. Always provide daily updates to the client and try to make a video of the work done and send it to the client to keep the client up to date. I mean, it, uh, this explained itself. So when you have made a video of the work, the client knows what you have done, and then ask the client, "Do you want any? Do you like what you what you see here? If you don't, tell it to me right now. I'm not going to come back and correct this or make any changes." So that's what you well, that's what you should learn to do. Uh, next slide, and we are done. So it's. So now we're going to move to the question and answer session and we can also do a little bit of role play if somebody wants to do some role play and that's it.
Water, please. Water, water, water. 